I'd like to thank everybody for coming to Yale China's first fireside chat of the 2012-2013 academic year. Uh, you'll notice that I'm not the face that normally sits at the front of the room for these. Uh, my name is Katie Multani Mir. I'm the manager of Yale China's Leadership and Service Program. Our executive director, Nancy O. Mosbach, is extremely sorry that she can't be here today, but she has a fever and thought it, it might not be, you know, good to pass it on to the attendees of the event. So I'm filling in today, but. Um, just a little bit about Yale China before we get, begin. Yale China is a private nonprofit organization with programs in education, health, public service, and the arts. We were founded in 1901 by four graduates of Yale University. Um, we started in 1909 with our teaching fellowship program, sending Yale graduates to China to teach for two years, and have continued that since that time as well as started a whole slew of other programs, um, plenty of which is available in the Yale China Review and information uh, is also available on our website, which is yalechina.org. But uh, today we are very, very excited and grateful to have Amy Clay here, who's uh, an author and a friend of Yale China. Uh, we met Amy and her husband Tom last year on the Shonen Service and Cultural Exchange Program. We took 200 people to rural China for a week of service and learning. And uh, we had the pleasure, along with Connie, who's back there, and a few, many others, to spend a whole week with Amy and Tom getting to to know them and learn about um, the work we did. I do want to start by thanking a few sponsors for today's um, chat, Dr. and Mrs. Henry Chang and the Herbert Lee Grayson Foundation, both of whom provided generous support for this talk. Um, and of course, thank you to, to Amy herself. So a few things about the format today. We'll start with just with a very brief introduction of the book. Amy will read a selection from the book. Uh, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. But a little bit about our speaker. Uh, Amy was born in Shanghai, grew up in Hong Kong, lived in Wappingers Falls, New York for 39 years, and now lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, she maintains her Chinese ancestry through her writing, uh, earned her bachelor's degree through St. John's, from St. John's University, master's degree from Vassar College, and is retired from teaching at Bennett College and Dutchess County, a uh, Dutchess Community College, excuse me. She's twice won the Tail Spinner competition sponsored by the Poughkeepsie, Ju Poughkeepsie Journal, excuse me. One of the judges said that her work has a very strong cultural appeal and gives the reader a quick, instant understanding of Chinese values and how they differ from our own. As well, uh, the work is simply written, perhaps best written of all the stories in the competition. Her short stories and essays have appeared in Prima Materia, Short Story International, CAAC Inflex Magazine, Duchess Magazine, The Country, and other magazines and anthologies. Uh, Andover Green published one of her children's stories in Six Inches to England, an anthology of international children's stories. She previously published the well-received young adult thriller Intrigue in the House of Wong. Um, Amy's most recent novel, and the subject of this afternoon's talk, is the book A Concubine for the Family, which is based on Amy's own family history. But uh, So that's, I think that's enough for me, but I'd like to turn it over to, to Amy Quay to discuss her book and also to give you a read. So please join me in welcoming her. stand up so that you could hear me better, okay? And uh, first, uh, uh, thank you all for coming. I plan to read a few pages from the book, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my background, and then we'll open for questions and discussion. I don't want this to be a lecture, so I have nothing to lecture. Now, this passage coming is set in 1937 in Hangzhou, uh, where President Nixon visited when he first went to uh, China. And uh, there are three characters involved here. There's a, uh, the family history part is a scaffolding for the story. And the first character, Purple Jane, is based upon my uh, grandmother. And she has bound feet. And she's totally dependent on her personal maid, Orchid. And, uh, uh, and just before the scene, um, her daughter had come in and showed her a picture of a very clear blue lake set up next to two bell shaped red mountains. And it's a, 
sea from America, of course, and uh, she had always thought about wilderness, something wild, chaotic, and, and something associated with war. But somehow with this picture make her feel like she's going to want to be a bird, to, to be free and go into adventures. And, um, and then her brother came in. Uh, her brother, her half-brother, Glorious Dragon, um, lives in Shanghai, and uh, he, he, he's a wheeler dealer, and he's the one that always uh, brings her into uh, uh, interesting situations. And now I've, synops I've put a little synopsis of uh, what went on before the see so we have an understanding. Morning peace, JJ. They, uh, they address each other by always by relational term. JJ means older sister. So you can only address uh, people by name if they are servants or people younger, children, for instance. And so he comes in and says, Good morning, JJ. Glorious dragon entered his sister's sitting room. He was five feet ten. In his wool suit, he looked like an Oxford student on a foreign holiday. Morning peace, dragon. But it is already past ten o'clock. Were you up last night checking the company books? Turning to her maid, she ordered, Orchid, bring us tea. I don't want tea, was dragon motion Orchid to stay and started pacing. Everyone knows I'm here to check on my family, our family business. I don't want to look at the books. He stared at the ground. I'm here to ask for your help. It is a worthy adventure. He proceeded to tell them that he had plans to disrupt a new opium den in town. He'll disguise himself, but he'll need a female companion to distract attention. Coco Jay's heart was pounding like a drum, but she could feel the sunlight warming the crystalline lake. She furrowed her brows and mumbled, You're determined to do this? Yes, I'll do it with or without your help. It was so seldom that Purple Jay could do anything important outside her home. She would have to practice medicine. She would love to practice medicine. But who would want to train a female? Now her brother had asked for help. Maybe she could supply the female companion. Yes. Orchid would be just ideal. Orchid is the only one I can trust. The bird inside her took flight. Then it was decided that she would go too. She would hide behind the front seat. And uh, Gloria's driver pulled out trunks on, a pair of high heel shoes, and a Shanghai magazine so that Orchid could be made up to look like a fancy woman. Of course, he had already uh, scouted out the building, and they, had, they were going to have a grand opening, repeat with fireworks. So here's a scene that he goes to the uh, opium. When Glorious Dragon arrived the next afternoon to take his sister and her maid for a drive, no one suspected anything. Once inside the car, Purple Jay drew the curtains closer around the back seat. Despite her practice session, Olga trembled so much that Purple Jay had to help assemble her disguise. You do just fine. Remember how families and fortunes are destroyed by the drug? Purple Jay applied Olga's makeup and tried to keep her hands steady. She repeated the same instructions she had given the day before. You don't have to say anything. Just serve the old people the way you serve. You saw my father serve when he was a. Yes, I, I'll try my best. I can old answer. She had heard enough about the evils of opium, but she had never entered a opium land. She was a tree, but was so edgy. Her mistress had guided her all her life, and now her blind trust tempered her anxiety and excitement. 
Gauri's dragon drove into a quiet lane to take off his suit jacket. He slipped on a Chinese robe and put on a jaunty hat, glasses, and a mustache. Oh, you look like a stranger, Pukunjin laughed nervously. They parked behind the silver palace. When they saw that no one was around, Gloria's dragon helped walk out of the car. Crouched behind the front seat, Purple Jay watched her brother adopt a splayed walk while Orchid clung to his arm. Orchid walked with mincing steps, which gave her a seductive spray. Purple Jay's legs felt sore and she was twisted into a comfortable position but she did not feel the usual pains in her feet. If she weren't a cripple, would she have taken Orchid's place in this plan? Yes, she might have. Her courage and the presence, her outrage at the presence of the opium den in town overshadowed her usual concerns for propriety and decorum. She perspired. She felt restless and young again. She shifted in a cramped space, fiddled with her handkerchief, and imagined herself swimming in the aqua lake. She peeked out the window. Everything was quiet. Should she tap on the horn if she saw something suspicious? Oh, please, please, don't let anyone find out about her role. She prayed to Guan Yin Buddha. Glorious dragon that walked into the parlor. As expected, the proprietor greeted them as he would any prosperous couple ready to forego dinner for the pipe. Orchid in her fancy clothes passed as a prostitute. Her shaky steps amply demonstrated that she was in dire need of a fix and would lapse into oblivion after just a few puffs. Reassured, the proprietor left for his evening meal. The smokers lolled on their rosewood beds and sucked on their pipes. The opium lamps lit the artificially darkened den like fireflies, fluttering with each draw of the smokers. Gloria's dragon and Orca walked by several wasted figures, hunched over the miniature hurricane house. Some stared up at them with vacant eyes. Saliva dribbled from their gaping mouths revealing slow stained teeth. The others would, have, would not have recognized their own mothers. Several serving girls hovered over the reclining bodies. Some twirled the thin stick in a jar of paste, shaping it into a pallet. After turning and warming the brown blob over a small dusty lamp, they placed the pallet into the pipe's porcelain bowl inverting it over a glowing fire to burn the opium. The smoker sucked on the pipe and exhaled. Thin whips of fumes crawled around the mouth and nostrils. Then he leaned into his pipe and slowly and steadily he inhaled again, the little flame winking eerily in the darkness. Glorious dragon chose a bed near the entrance for a quick gathering. After picking up, picking out the pipes and opium, he motioned the serving girl to leave them alone. Orca began to twirl the open pace. The, ad, the atmosphere of lazy inattention stirred Gloria's driving to action. With a sleight of hand, he pulled out strings of firecrackers from his robe and lit the long fuse light. He hurled them towards the corner of draperies where the fireworks were stacked outside the window. He threw his opium lamp after the firecrackers, adding fuel to the sparks. Firecrackers banged, immediately followed by screams and shouts. Fire cracked up draperies and burst into flaming columns that consumed the wooden beams overhead. Everyone, even those who were comatose, struggled to reach the door. Some hobbled, some crawled on their hands and knees, and many had to be carried to safety. Once outside, Gloria's dragon avoided looking into the frightened eyes surrounding him. More loud bursts followed. The burning building ignited fireworks outside, which looked anemic under the afternoon sky. The raw flames 
sent everyone coughing and scrambling. The staff and other shouting men gathered to help. They flailed their arms in frustration. Their buckets of water could not contain the fire. Crowds gathered across the street. All eyes were riveted on the fiery display. Glorious dragon and orcas slipped into their car and noticed. Purple Jade peeked through the curtains and mumbled, Oh, we told for, oh, we told for to hurt the Guan Yu Buddha. Oh, dragon, you didn't tell me you would burn the place. Purple Jade gasped as soon as her brother came near. People can get killed. They're half dead anyway. Boris Dragon scrunched down in the front seat and removed his disguise. I, uh, I was born in Shanghai as a kid in nation. Now the picture here are not my grandmother, but Tom's grandmother. My parents left Shanghai without bringing, they thought they could go back, so they never brought pictures. But there's Tom's grandmother who's sitting and you don't see her feet. And uh, this is her maid. And the clothing is the period of that period. And uh, so, uh, the book is fiction, as I said, the sca scaffolding is the true uh, story. My grandmother did give my grandfather a concubine for his birthday in order to get an heir. They had no sons. And it's the role of a virtuous woman to provide an heir for the family. I had, uh, when I was very young, I had witnessed my uh, my grandmother being bathed by the maid, uh, my second grandmother. And uh, it was such a loving, tender scene that I made it the first chapter of the book. And of course, it's, it's very, for a child to witness bound feet is quite an impression. And uh, uh, due to the war, uh, my family left Shanghai early in 1949 and went to Hong Kong, where I attended a school uh, ran by St. Paul the Shah nuns. Uh, these mostly Irish nuns spoke French in the convent, taught as English, and taught as Chinese as a second language. So from a very early age, I was uh, striving two cultures. I won't tell you exactly when I was born. <laughs> so, but I'm happy to tell you that I'm a grandmother. <laughs> um, so, I guess this is about it. Oh, uh, I, last time as Katie said, we went to China. If you think all this old stuff is no longer relevant to farm in China, we went to China and Michael Shear, one of the teaching fellows, Help me by this fan. So it just shows how uh, so many of the Chinese customs and practices and culture remain the same. Here's that this fan says, don't be angry. And it talks about how you, uh, how difficult it is to maintain a marriage and how your uh, children's and grandchildren's business are their business. Don't get, don't meddle in it. <laughs> and don't compare yourself to your friends and your relatives. You have your own life. And so somebody has written this poem, put it on the fan. So these are supposedly very old values. It continues. And uh, uh, and last uh, week we had a uh, we went to a memorial. And some men stood up and recited a poem in this old-fashioned sing-song way. And so these old values and old cultural norms still are very, very prominent in Chinese culture. So when you're talking to the modern Chinese, uh, I think in this country we tend to view every Chinese as a businessman but uh, the heart of the Chinese is still in their culture. So uh, it's something that uh, will help people understand. Yeah, are there any questions? Uh, 
be happy to have a discussion. So I think what we'll do, I'll start with a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to the group. I'm oh, sorry. Right. Sure. I actually wanted to ask you to discuss what essentially is a central event in this book and in your family, which is the gift of the concubine. And for maybe to help those, you know, anyone in the audience who's not really familiar with yeah. that aspect of Chinese culture, why a wife would give that sort of gift to her husband for his birthday, and why the idea of a son as an heir is so important. Well, uh, you know, Henry VIII cut off his wife's head because they, he wanted a son. So it's a very, it found time immemorial. Abraham had, uh, had to take uh, a concubine to, and not for a son, to, I, just to have concubines. I think the world over, um, if all the cultures had uh, many, the, especially women, men who are prominent and successful will have um, more than one wife. And uh, I think today um, a lot of these men have uh, mistresses and it's just uh, a thing to do in those old days. And in the old days they think, they didn't understand that it's a man who's responsible for having the male, female children, right? <laughs> now we know, but in the old days it's always the women's fault <laughs> if you didn't get a son. So they keep changing your wives until they get a get a son. Maybe, it, of course, the, in in our family, uh, the concubine produced two more daughters. Mm -hmm. And and the, the in the background of this uh, this story is is that um, it's the wars. China has had wars for a hundred years. The last hundred years experience the second sign of Japanese war, the war inside between the communists and the nationalists. And uh, it just never, and then, you know, the Cultural Revolution, it just has never ended. So this family, uh, the, this book is divided into three parts. The first book ends with the wife giving the husband a concubine for his, uh, for his birthday. And everybody applauded this act because she's smart. If you waited for your husband to go and find another woman, the woman will be a stranger. Mm -hmm. She, This orchid she had picked up from the street uh, when she had found her chewing on tree boss. She was a little bit ago, five years old. And she took her in and became her mother, teacher, companion. So here's the woman that she really trusted. And so I started the, the book with the scene because it, it just delineates their relationship. It's relationship, the solidarity of these two women and how important the family is in uh, how they would give just everything to maintain the strength of the family. Unfortunately, with wars, I'm sure many Chinese here with have family history that have known all the uh, diaspora, the, the people have suffered through the wars and being separated. And the book ends with the um, dispersal of the family. So then, how closely is how close are these characters to your family members? And did you find as it I said, it's just a scaffolding in the very beginning. Uh, in, for some reason, uh, in the, most households, there are always more women. You know, I guess because of the war, the man has gone to war. I don't know where they died or whatever. That in the in the house, uh, in the house of. Uh, even modest means, middle class families will have servants. So if we used to have um, my mother's nursemaid living with us. She's sort of like chief honcho that oversees the other uh, servants. And then the, their um, aunts, they come to help make dumplings. And, and they sat around and talked in a sort of sewing circle, they mended things don't throw away things, something's broken. Everybody's learning and doing things for 
each other, then they talk and tell stories. So when, when you're a child, you just sit there and listen to the different stories. And um, I had heard about this uncle who, uh, during the war, uh, tried to share a mistress with Chiang uh, bodyguard. And they would say, oh, he's, you know, he's swatting a fly on top of a tiger's head, you know. <laughs> so, and uh, stories like that, and how he used to, um, he used to, uh, uh, after the war, he has nothing. He was penniless. He came into Shanghai, and he found out from Sook's connection that the nationalists are looking for uh, uniforms. So he rented a go-down, he rented a, uh, a warehouse, and rented uh, the uh, sewing machines, a whole bunch of people to come in and do sewing things. So they got the contract, even though he had no company. So, and that's how he started. And these stories I hear and I put in the book, and um, uh, how the Chinese feel about the Western, the Western perceptions of things. And, uh, and, and also, uh, I use, especially for brothers and sisters, I use DD for uh, youngest, younger brother, JJ for older sister, maybe for younger sister, because it somehow when you call somebody uh, a dragon D or uh, purple J, you know that you, somehow your place is established in the family. And these, are, these things cannot be translated, but it gives you that feeling of importance, the family solidarity. And uh, so I use some of these cultural uh, terms in the, in the book. Uh, so, uh, let's open it to the next. Thank you for the reading. Why did you when is that reading set? What you know, what year would the would the reading be set? Nineteen thirty seven. Okay. That's a year that's a year but this is before the uh, the Japanese formally invaded China. Right. And the the occasion was Japanese invaded China. Uh, they didn't declare war, but they went to Beijing. Beijing and and but Manchuria was already under Japanese occupation for many years. Was the opium then still that, uh, that, that, that many? In other words, were the opium uh, culture still that much in effect? Oh, yes. And, and why uh, did you pick that to read? Oh, because uh, several reasons. The, the, um, the Japanese had occupied Manchuria, uh, whereas the Chinese had always called it the um, the eastern provinces, northeastern provinces. So the Manchuria is the name that's given to uh, that provinces by the Japanese, and they want to try to call it Manchukuo. I don't know if you saw the movie of the Chinese, uh, uh, the last emperor. They tried to establish, he, he, the Japanese tried to establish him as the, uh, the Chinese uh, emperor again. And then they influenced the uh, neighboring provinces, the Jeho and Ch Chawa provinces, and all the Arab land was used to cultivate opium. And they flooded. The, the opium came into China in the 1800s through the British first one. But in the 30s, they flooded the country with opium. So even the poorest Rickshaw Poland could afford to take a swim. It's cheaper than a few cents. So it's, instead of taking an aspirin, they smoke opium. Mm -hmm. And this whole society was in way this Tom grew up, he remembered his grandfather smoking opium. And uh, it's something like, you know, after dinner you have a pipe. And this is, and it, uh, I mentioned in the book that too, that Wallace Simpson, the king, supposedly King Edward's uh, wife. Yeah. 
um, and she came to China to sample the gaiety, and uh, and a lot of famous people. Just it's like in your now people go to New York City, I guess, to have a good time. But of course, in those days, they went to Shanghai, and Shanghai has this reputation of being really wild and interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, what was the, the writing process? Uh, I know you went back to China. Did you go to the archive? Did you use, I know it's fiction, yeah. but did you use letters, um, pictures? How did you try to rebuild all this? Uh, I, I, I research, I read books. And as I said, a lot of the things are, are from memory, the stories I've heard. Uh -huh. And uh, I decided to fictionalize it because uh, Number one, when I started the book, my parents were alive, and they wouldn't have liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, but once I started writing fiction, it's so liberating. It's just so wonderful. And the lake I did describe is in the Aspen, uh, uh, Colorado. And so you could put in anything, <laughs> you know? And you, it's so liberating, so you could, uh, but I remember my grandmother, she was already uh, Sina, and she used to be always mumbling uh, verses. And uh, that's why they, she quotes verses, uh, poetry all the time. And uh, often you can sing songs. It's a very sad story. And uh, I made her a lot stronger than she was, what I remember. And these are the liberties you can take as a fiction, as a model. What, what was the motive for the Japanese to uh, get everybody hooked on uh, opium? Well, it's obvious, really, because uh, they want to poison the country. They wanted to weaken the people? Weaken the people. They became addicted, didn't they? Right. So every, every, even uh, well-educated people, you know, they would smoke. Well, sometimes, you know, in all our lives, you have sore arms and sore legs, and you have times of disappointment and unhappiness. And some people get more addicted than others. But, you know, that uh, uh, if, it's, if it's something that's so cheap and available, that's their whole purpose. And they're not chosen. The English did it for a different purpose, though. They did it to break the uh, ice with trade with for right. porcelain. Right? Well, the Chinese uh, always thought about themselves as the Middle Kingdom. It's the center of the culture. And the Chinese don't think of themselves as, as aggressive because uh, China became very big because, like, uh, Ganges Khan came from Mongolia. He conquered China and established the Yuan Dynasty. They became Chinese. They were conquered by the culture. And then the Man Manchus from Manchuria came over, and that's the last Chinese dynasty, Qing Dynasty. They conquered China and established the Qing Dynasty. So they became Chinese. So the Chinese grew their empire by absorbing the invaders. So, the, and the Chinese were inordinately proud because all the neighboring countries paid tribute to them, okay? And when, uh, when England sent, I think, Carthy, General Carthy uh, came to, uh, to want to trade, uh, China wanted to kneel. The emperor said, you kneel. And they told me, you have to kneel. And of course, he didn't like that. He wouldn't like that. And then the, the England, uh, the English love Chinese tea. They couldn't live without Chinese tea. <laughs> and silk. In the old days, the technology of silk making is like a present in computers. You know? And you look at George Washington's uh, clothing. If all the proper, the rich, big people, prominent people wear silk, silk vest, embroidery, 
whatever, you know. And uh, uh, we used to live near Poughkeepsie in Hyde Park, in Roosevelt's home. And uh, the, uh, his, one of his, not his ancestor, but I think this is Roosevelt's ancestor, was a little opium trader. Has all these beautiful fossil and things. So what happens is the West is, and China only want the silver. They want all the silk, they want the porcelain, they want the tea, and China only wants the silk. And they don't want to buy Western things. They think technology, uh, England already has steam engines, steamboats, and all these. They think those are toys. And they, uh, they don't want to buy English wool. In those days, the wool was very scratchy and smooth like today. So China said, we trade, but you give us silver. And all of a sudden, all the silver was going to China, and they didn't like that. So uh, of course, China had gunpowder, invented gunpowder for fireworks. And the British had guns. So they won the Opium War, and, and that's how Hong Kong became British. And Returned in 1997, and uh, uh, I said that they, uh, for 1937, the story because in 1936, um, uh, this man called Zhang Shuilao, he kidnapped Chiang Kai Shek in Xi'an, the Xi'an incident, and then um, he forced Chiang Kai Shek to unite with the communists. And that, that begins the Second World War because Japan does not want China united. Chiang Kai shek was fighting the communists rather than the Japanese. So, and they did it in a very Chinese way. The, uh, he kidnapped Chiang Kai shek and followed Chiang Kai shek back to Beijing, uh, back to Nanjing, Nanjing to, um, to, to give Chiang Kai shek face. And he was under house arrest for the rest of his life. And I, the story was that Chiang Kai Shek gave him, did not kill him, but give him all the opium. So the guy was, you know. But he eventually uh, uh, survived and came to, I think he died in Hawaii. So it's a, uh, but this is a Chinese way of doing things, and so I wove that into the story that Purple Jade decided to solve the problem of the air the Chinese way. Because the nation is uniting, and she would do something, you know. That's why I chose 37. And it's just before the Japanese war, second world war. How does one go about finding the country? How? How did one go about finding the tents? <laughs> I changed the tents. I changed the tents. I've been thinking about it. Yes. In the beginning of the book, I said uh, I thank my husband for all his help in during my neurotic wounds and whatever. And uh, he helps me a great deal with the computer and technical stuff. But then I never give him a concubine. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fact that the book just came out. So, but you think you're gonna have uh, maybe some feedback of other ladies like you? Gonna say, okay, my grandmother also had a concubine. You're gonna have like more oh, stories. Yes. Are you getting feedback? It's very. Does any one uh, Chinese American ladies here who have come from family with concubines? No. Because I understand you're too young. <laughs> My grandfather had a concubine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes, it's very common. Yeah. I didn't really realize that I had two grandmothers until at the age of ten. Why well, I called two ladies grandmother? Yeah. And then my father said, "Oh, she is your second grandmother." Oh, yeah. I was like, well, sorry. in this story, you know, Orca considers herself very lucky because if you, when you are made like that, in bad families, you could be sold. 
resold and resold, and you could be abused. Mm -hmm. And then there are stories, I think the recent Chinese movie, Zhang Yimao's movies, has a lot of these, uh, the, the fighting between the wives, you know, the common. But in real life, I think it's, there are very many cases like my grandmother's, that the family work together. And uh, so it, it's not uh, always all these cutting and fighting. So I, I think it's you. Some of my friends were very turned off by the work on people. They think, you know, don't tell me about it. And the thing is, in China, it's so common. If you have any Chinese contacts, you wouldn't be surprised at all. And in this uh, August case, she's very grateful because she will not be married out into the field by to some poor farmer's house where she had grown up uh, being trained as a lady and uh, to be married off to the to some uh, coolie or uh, farmer would have been a very tough life and in real life which i did not uh, mention in the book um, when my after my grandmother gave her personal maid to my grandfather was a concubine. She had another maid who ran away in anger because she was not chosen. Oh. Oh. You know, and uh, and my mother used to say that uh, uh, we now like to eat red rice because that's supposed to be more healthy for you than the white rice. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Oh, I used to eat that. Egg. That maid who ran away had invited her to." the farmhouse to dinner and she had cooked red rice and I guess that's the rice um, without the polishing the rich people want things mm -hmm. white and sweet but you know the, it's a tough brown rice the, the brown or red rice that the, uh, that the farmers eat mm -hmm. so it's a uh, it's something that uh, you know we don't we we could use things so differently now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just wonder in the, in your research in general outside of your immediate family history, the purpose of, of seemed to be to have an heir, male heir, yeah. to fulfill the duties. Yeah. It, how did this? I haven't finished the book. How yeah. did this? Uh, Pan out in your story or in your in your family. Well, in the in uh, by thirty seven, actually, uh, it may not be legally essential to have a male heir, but tradition changes very slowly. And this um, in China in the old days, when a man dies, the male heir holds the head of the. the father and place it on a pillow in the coffin. Okay? Now nobody, nobody would want to do that. If you don't have an heir, nobody would want to do that for you unless they're named an heir. Mm -hmm. So it's in, it's imperative that they get an heir or your cousin, your some some male cousin's son will come and take over. So was that necessary in your family, or was that part fictional? Um, that part is real. That in that in, that I've heard, this is what you do. Actually, my mother told me. You know, uh, I asked her why is it that she uh, has to to have a concubine to be to have an heir, and my mother said, you know, the. Uh, that's what they have to do. Because but was there an heir? Well, no, there was no heir because my grandfather died in Chongqing. After he, after, I'm working on a on a sequel because everybody's asking. <laughs> everybody's asking me what happened to the three girls. And it's four girls because the. My grandma had two girls, and then the concubine had two girls. And ah, one died during, during the Japanese warming of 
Hong Kong. So it's three girls, and everybody, my, I write a school with mm -hmm. people that I know who say, yeah, what happened to the girls? What happened to the girls? So <laughs> you have to keep writing. <laughs> now the other part of my question was the feedback you would get. I, was thinking, I assume that the book is going to be translated in uh, I don't know. know. I don't know. No. Yeah, I have gone to gone to a uh, a conference in Harvard, and uh, um, there were all these uh, established writers, and then there was this guy who is the central uh, Chinese uh, works for this agency that's the biggest Chinese translation out in China, and when I was in in Beijing. He treated us to uh, a really fabulous meal because I said, I'll take you out. I, track, I contacted him and said, I'm in Beijing, I'll take you out. He said, no, 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 I'm going to be the host. And this fa fabulous meal, you know, and I kept seeing to time. He must have mistaken me for somebody else because <laughs> I'm nobody, you know. <laughs> so, but, so, and then I told him, I, this book is coming, he said, send it to me. So I sent it to him. I haven't heard, <laughs> so I don't know. You know, in China, it's so uh, everything is so political. It all depends, and the censorship. So, whatever will be, will be. Is I can't assume anything. And at this point in my life, I'm not willing to spend tons of money to influence things. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yes. I got two questions. I want to know what the emotion or feelings of the grandfather who, who is receiving the concubine. Yes. Because I think at, at that time, your grandmother or the grandfather, they're married, it's not free marriage, it's kind right. of right. arranged marriage. So yeah. what does the grandfather think? And the second question is, mm, for you, what's the meaning of this book? Like writing your family history or anything you want to talk to readers? Yeah. Well. My grandfather, I really didn't know, okay? So I made him up to be very righteous and very, I know he's a, in, in China you call a learned person as a book fragrant person. You come from a family. So I use these terms to give you the feeling of, of the culture as well. And he is a learned person. He had gone to the uh, St. John's University in Shanghai. So he's Western trained. At first, he didn't, didn't want to marry my grandmother because um, she's old fashioned. But then uh, his father promised him a home of his own. He, his father has concubines, of course. And uh, so instead of uh, usually when you marry, you go to live in your father's house, another suite. Of and he promised her that he could have a home of his own. So, um, so he has a home of his own. And so, but then he admired uh, Purple J in the book. I really don't know exactly how the relationship was because um, he, he was, I think, I, he was not dead, but I think he was in uh, when I was born. But he was dead by the time I knew anything, you know. So, um, but you know, in the book, I made the two of them compatible uh, in in their learning. He admires her uh, writing verses. He, she's a good chess player, and, but um, and she manages the house very well. She does her part that's expected of her, and he was always a patriot because he was always writing articles to, uh, against the Japanese and so forth. And contributed to the downfall of the family. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Uh, let's just give our We have the book on sale. Amy has agreed to sign copies for us if anyone's interested. And we need to sign it.
Sure, we'll have signing in the back in just a minute, as well as um, Yale China Centennial books, if anyone's interested in Yale China history, as it matches up with Amy's books, but also the year end. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the first, uh, and we just wanted to present Amy with this uh, token of our appreciation. Thank you so much for being a good friend to Yale China. Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome.